What does it mean to be under the law? It's a phrase only Paul uses, and he uses it in three of his letters, in Romans, 1 Corinthians, and Galatians. You may not be completely familiar with the, the term, so I'm going to read a couple of verses that have it in there. We'll turn to these later, so don't just, just listen right now. One is in Romans 6, verse 14, where it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. And in Galatians 5, 18, it says, But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, these two passages show us <clears throat> that whatever it means to be under the law, it doesn't apply to us, or shouldn't, and therefore doesn't seem to be desirable. In Romans, Paul says we are under grace instead. And in Galatians, he says if we're led by the Spirit, then we're not under the law. I've seen various explanations offered as to what Paul means. <clears throat> and today, I would like to offer one that perhaps you have not heard before. One common idea put forth is that we are not under the burden and obligation of the law. And we no longer have to keep the law. If you think that is the case, then I question why, are you, why you are here. <clears throat> but we will see plenty from Paul to show he did not mean that. Another idea I've heard, and perhaps <clears throat> you have heard as well, is that we are not under the penalty of the law. That makes some sense. In the passages we looked at earlier, <clears throat> we would read, sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the penalty of the law, but under grace. Fair enough. <clears throat> the grace of God certainly includes the element of forgiveness, uh, removing the penalty so sin will not have dominion over us. And in the other passage, if you be led by the Spirit, you are not under the penalty of the law. Again, I can see that as a true concept, but is that what Paul meant? What do you do, for example, with Galatians 4.21, which has this phrase? It says, tell me, you that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? Why would anyone desire to be under the penalty of the law? So I suggest Paul did not mean under the penalty of the law. Still another idea of what Paul meant is that Paul is speaking of a different law. Perhaps the ritual law or the law of circumcision. Or what is stated in Romans 8 is the law of sin and death. I heard that suggested by somebody. I'm not entirely sure how this differs from the law of God, but the emphasis seems to be on the idea that when we break the law, it brings about sin and death, which we are freed from. But isn't that true of all of God's law, making it just a semantic game we're playing? I don't think Paul is dealing with just a limited subset of God's law. Rather, I would like to suggest that there is a much simpler way to look at what Paul means by under the law. There is a subject which comes up repeatedly in the New Testament. It is the contrast between keeping the law in the Old Testament context versus the New Testament context. The Jews, especially the Pharisees, were heavily focused on keeping the law as the means of their salvation. They felt that if they could keep the law perfectly, they would be saved. So doing the works of the law was critical to them. But the law was written on stones. It was ex external. And no amount of external rules was going to cause them to keep a spiritual law in its full intent. It isn't hard to, murder, to not murder someone, 
but do not hate them. Do not hate even your enemies. To establish a difference between hating the deed and hating the person. And then make that second nature to you. That's another matter. Paul emphasized a new covenant where the law was written in our hearts. It was internalized. And comments about this contrast are scattered throughout his letters. So we are essentially here looking at the difference between the old and the new covenants. The book of Hebrews has a lot to say about the covenants. And I'm going to read quite a bit from it. I'm going to start in Hebrews 7. Hebrews 7. And I'm going to begin with verse 11. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? Now, what's being discussed here is the fact that Jesus Christ was under the order of Melchizedek, and we'll see that in detail here. And so he's asking, well, if the law were perfect and established the Levitical priesthood, why would there have to be a change? And it says in verse 12, for the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. And it is yet far more evident if, in the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who has come not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For, he testifies, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness, for the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing of, in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. So here he's establishing this contrast between the law, which made nothing perfect, and the better hope. And inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, it was merely an inherited role, but he with an oath by him who said to him, the Lord has sworn, sworn and will not relent, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness, but the word of the oath, which came after the law, it was made in Psalm 110, if you're not familiar with where the quote came from, it was, uh, which was many, many years after the law given in Exodus, which came after the law appoints the son who has been perfected forever. In chapter 8, Paul goes into even more detail about the covenants. So I'd like to read a section of that beginning in verse 6. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, behold, the days are coming, says the Eternal, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, 
Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Eternal. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Eternal. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. So this is the essence of the new covenant. It's not doing away with the law. It is making the law part of our mind, part of our hearts, to internalize it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor, and none his brother, saying, Know the Eternal. For all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. In that he says, A new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now, what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. In Romans 3, Romans 3 and verse 20, we read this. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And why does he say here that the deeds of the law cannot justify us? Well, he continues in verse 21 by saying, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So we read that the old covenant lacked this critical element, the forgiveness which, made, which was <clears throat> made possible by Jesus' sacrifice and the ability to be made right with God. But doing all these deeds of the law, all have sinned. We needed that sacrifice, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believes in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. The law is established because we are still keeping it, but now we're keeping it correctly. The deeds of the law didn't accomplish anything because it was not done through the spirit and intent of the law. In chapter 9 of Romans, chapter 9 of Romans, uh, in verse 30, I'm going to read this in the uh, English Standard Version because it seems a little clearer in the intent that I'm intending to bring across here. Romans 9, verse 30, what shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it, that is, a righteousness that is by faith. What's interesting here is that he's pointing out the Gentiles did not go through a period of trying to pursue righteousness by keeping the letter of the law written on stone. Essentially, the Gentiles bypassed the Old Covenant. They went straight to the New Covenant, and through the righteousness that is by faith, are having the law written on their hearts. In verse 31, but that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reach, reaching that law. So what the Jews and the Pharisees and the Old Testament Israelites were doing was attempting to receive that righteousness and perfection by keeping the law, 
in their own way instead of through God's spirit. Verse 32, why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone, meaning, of course, Jesus Christ, which changed everything. In Titus 3, in verse 4, Paul writes this to the uh, evangelist Timothy. He says in Titus 3, verse 4, When the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. So he's saying here that it's not by the works of righteousness that we have done that we're saved, but through the uh, mercy of God, and as he continues, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on, an, on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Paul preached this message throughout his ministry. One of the first messages that he did preach was given in Acts 13. Acts 13, this is on his first missionary journey. He's made it up to Antioch of Pisidia. He goes into the synagogue and he's busy talking to the Jews. And as he reaches the end of his message, we read this in verse 38 of Acts 13. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, referring to Jesus Christ. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Now that message did not sit well with them. It infuriated the Jews, or at least some of them, who eventually ousted them, Paul and Barnabas, from the synagogue. For many of the Jews, Pharisees in particular, were fixated on the idea that if they could just keep the law better, keep it perfectly, then they could receive salvation. And frankly, the old covenant only offered that possibility. But as Paul said, they could not be justified through the law of Moses. It took more, which is why God created the new covenant. Now, those who think that it is important to keep the law, that is, who don't think it is important to keep the law of God, cite these verses and others from Paul to prove their case. They're saying, you can't, works of the law did no good, so we don't have to keep the law. Now, of course, they ignore Paul's frequent rebuttal to that idea. We've, we've read a few of them, but I'll, I'll just cite a couple more real quickly. Romans 6.1, he says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? So we're not just supposed to ignore the law. It gets even more explicit in Romans 7, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. It's the law that defines what sin is. But those who know that we must keep the law have sometimes reacted to these verses that, we are, that, that are being cited by saying that Paul wasn't talking about the law of God. He was talking about the ritual law, or maybe just the law of circumcision. I would like to suggest that this is not true. Paul was referring to the law as delivered from Mount Sinai as being the terms of the Old Covenant. Ironically, virtually all of these difficult scriptures for which explanations have been offered to get around the fact that Paul meant the law can actually be resolved more simply by acknowledging that he meant the law as the sole basis for the administration of the Old Covenant. Not that he was doing away with it, but he was doing away with something else in contrast to the New Covenant, which added the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and the Holy Spirit by which we can internalize the law to keep it in its spiritual intent as part of our new nature. 
And this applies to the phrase under the law. So let's go through all of the instances of that phrase and I'll demonstrate what I'm referring to. If we go back to Galatians 4 and verse 21, one of the ones I cited earlier, Galatians 4 verse 21, We read, tell me, you that desire to be under the law. And I suggest that means you who desire to, be, to still be under the terms of the old covenant, as those Jews that he was talking to did. Do you not hear the law? And he continues by saying, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise which things are symbolic, for these are the two covenants. So he immediately launches into a description of the two covenants. It says the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar, for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all, for it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear, Break forth and shout, you who do not labor, for the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now, think about the old covenant given to the Israelites. Those are the only people for whom the, uh, the covenant was given. Compare that with the new covenant, which is being given to the Gentiles, to the entire world, and ultimately it will be in the millennium to, to the entire world. Uh, there are a lot more children that are going to be born from that new covenant than from the old. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as, he, but as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. The book of Galatians is dealing with the fact that the, the church there was being uh, persecuted by the Jews who are saying, you must keep all of the aspects of the law. Uh, and that's how you will be saved. And Paul is trying to counter that. Um, Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. We are not under the old covenant, but the new covenant. In the context of these verses, I'm not sure any other explanation of under the law makes sense in this case. Let's go to Romans 6, 14. We cited that one earlier. Romans 6, verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law. You're not under the administration or terms of the old covenant. But under grace, you're under the new covenant, the administration of the Spirit. Verse 15, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, under the old covenant? But under grace, God forbid. How about Galatians 5.18? Galatians 5.18, but if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Does this mean you are not under the penalty of the law, or does it really mean you are not under the administration of the Old Covenant, if you are led by the Holy Spirit? If the phrase is going to have a consistent application, penalty cannot be meant here, but rather under the Old Covenant. 1 Corinthians 9. I don't think we've gone to 1 Corinthians yet, but he does use this phrase here. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 20. He says, And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. The Jews are very much focused 
on being under the law, under the administration of the Old Covenant. Paul did his best to not alienate them, but demonstrated a reverence for the Old Covenant, even as he knew that was being replaced, so that he could gain their acceptance. Note this is another verse where the penalty of the law makes no sense. Paul was not trying to pretend he was under the penalty of the law. Let's go to Romans 3, verse 19. We've been to Romans 3 as well, but I deliberately left out verse 19. Romans 3, verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to them who are under the law, under the old covenant administration, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. And we read the rest of the chapter earlier. Let's go to Galatians 3. Galatians 3 and verse 23. Galatians 3.23. But before faith came, we might say before the new covenant came, we were kept under the law or under the terms of the old covenant, shut up unto faith, which should afterwards be revealed. So while there's still only the old covenant, that's all we could go by. Once faith came in, once the new covenant came in and was revealed to us, then we could switch to the terms of the new covenant. Galatians 4, verse 4. When the fullness of the time was come, God sent his son, made of a woman, made under the law, because the administration of the old covenant was still in effect, to redeem them that were under the law, under the old covenant, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So Jesus Christ came into a world where the old covenant was the only thing that was there in order to, that he may establish the new covenant to redeem those that were under the old covenant. These are the verses which use the phrase under the law in the King James Version. In my opinion, all of them make more sense when viewed under the lens of Paul's repeated discussion of the differences between the old and the new covenants. Being under the law is a reference to being under the administration of the law, essentially the old covenant, rather than the administration of the spirit, the new covenant. It is certainly not a put down of the law. In Romans 8, 4, it says that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. It is through internalizing the law and Christ living in us through his spirit to keep that law that we are made righteous. Not by doing it under our own power as the Jews felt they had to do in the old covenant. Now I have much more to say about this complex subject. But since Mr. Weber decided I should give another message before I disappear to Oregon again, he asked me to give another message in two weeks. I already have enough material for that message. <laughs>